Welcome to Shattering Mess, a program devoted to those who know that there's something dreadfully wrong with political, religious, media, military, and economic institutions. But today I owe the SRN an apology. I've uh, listened to it and have uh, criticized it uh, mercilessly uh, from the beginning. But now that they dug deep and found that there is a girl going to march in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade as a country clown with a bird on her head, you've got to really scratch beneath the surface to bring that caliber of news. And I know that my life is enriched, and I'm prepared for tomorrow now that uh, SRN has uh, brought me that bit of news. Turning to other news that, of course, is considerably less uh, insightful, it is uh, truly amazing, at least from my perspective, but then, you know, I'm not into Thanksgiving clowns with birds on their heads, that two of the most evil men in the world, the most two of the most corrupt men in the world, could well have saved America from um, entering a war and continuing a war. Uh, we know, of course, that, that Putin, despite the fact that George uh, W. Bush, King George II, looked into his soul and saw that it was good, um, <laughs> saved America from uh, engaging in the Syrian war, uh, which would have been the catalyst of World War III. Saved us all. We, we have postponed the inevitable by decades as a result of, uh, of Putin intervening and stopping Obama from doing uh, the suicidal. But now we've got Helmut Karzai in Afghanistan preventing Americans from being able to settle in and retain 10,000 troops in Afghanistan and continue to spend $5 billion a year building what we've broken. This report, Kabul, Afghanistan. President Obama's National Security Advisor, Susan E. Rice, told President Helmut Karzai of Afghanistan on Monday, by the way, it's the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, the news doesn't like to report it accurately, however, and Karzai is only president and that uh, he is a puppet of the United States, to stop his delay in signing a security agreement or potentially face the complete and final pullout of American troops by the end of 2014. <gasps> oh, my God. Either sign it or we're leaving. Could it only be so? But Mr. Karzai insisted on difficult new conditions, including the release of all inmates at the American prison camp of Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. I want you to remember that because there's another news item we're going to consider that right up there with, um, with Thanksgiving Day clowns as it relates to Guantanamo Bay prisoners, adding to the perception of the crisis between the two nations. Quote, Ambassador Rice reiterated that without a prompt signature, the U.S. would have no choice but to initiate planning for a post-2014 future in which there would be no U.S. or NATO troop presidents in Afghanistan, according to a public release issued by the White House. We've been there, what, 11, 12, 12 years now, I guess. Yeah, 12 years. All we've done is make a bad situation worse. We went on based upon a lie that al-Qaeda was... Uh, the responsible party for 9-11 was not true. Um, we already had uh, the uh, the culprit identified, um, where the FBI, CIA, anybody that could use the Internet knew that the plan concocted to fly planes into our uh, buildings as suicide bombers was conceived by Ramzi Yusuf in the Philippines. He was a member of, uh, of the S.W.O.R.D., uh, Abu uh, uh, Sambel in, uh, in the Philippines. Abu Sayyaf, I should say, in the Philippines. Abu Sayyaf. He was uh, quite active uh, there. Um, he had no affiliation with uh, al-Qaeda. Um, his uh, only subsequent link to al-Qaeda is that uh, either he or, uh, or 
Mohammed, Khalif Mohammed, uh, Sheikh Khalif Mohammed, um, one of his either sisters or relatives or a relative of, um, of um, Ramzi Yusuf intermarried, and, uh, and that brought the, uh, the two into proximity with one another. But in this situation, uh, Sheikh Khalid Mohammed was a deputy of Ramzi Yusuf, who was the mastermind. And so here's a war that was started based on a lie, that we should invade Afghanistan because al-Qaeda is responsible for, uh, was responsible for 9-11, and we need to hold them uh, accountable. We need to kill Osama bin Laden and destroy al-Qaeda. Well, the fact is that we entered out Afghanistan to fight a war against the Taliban, the very Taliban that the United States had uh, empowered and had armed to uh, to be its ally, its proxy in fighting the Soviet-backed government of Afghanistan many years ago during the Jimmy Carter administration. And now that we have devastated that country, and we have turned a country that had virtually no acts of terrorism into one of the world's most abused nations on earth in terms of terrorist attacks. Now we're saying, yeah, you either sign our agreement or we're no longer going to give you $5 billion and we're no longer going to leave 10,000 troops in your country. The White House voiced its objection to an extra demand by the uh, lawyer Herja, the, this is the Assembly of Elders in Afghanistan. You see, democracy and voting is uh, only convenient if we're trying to impose it, but if the people actually vote, gather to vote and express their opinion, and they're not um, governed by a dictator, uh, we don't like that anymore. But this was the, uh, this is what the elders, who are all fundamentalist Muslims, wanted. They wanted the release of all Guant- Guantanamo inmates. It insisted that that United States law, but, uh, of course, America has insisted that United States law would govern the release of those prisoners. And it had uh, no bearing on the agreement with Afghanistan. In fact, most of the prisoners were captured there in Afghanistan. So it has a great deal to do with Afghanistan. And U.S. law doesn't prevail in Gitmo which is why the captives from Afghanistan are in Gitmo, because they are in a foreign country where U.S. law does not prevail. So the United States is being completely hypocritical about every aspect of this. This is a quote. It said, that made the president very angry. His reaction was very strong and intense, Mr. Farzi said, the president said, we cannot separate the recommendations of the Loya Herja from the BSA agreement. We cannot pick and choose anymore. All of their recommendations have to be taken seriously. Well, either you impose a democracy where the the legislative body expresses uh, its will and you adhere to their will in their country, or you're a complete hypocrite, America. What's the bottom line here? What is it going to be? Are we going to recognize the a vote taken in another sovereign country regarding our invasion? Are we going to disregard it and say, you either own up to our demands or we're going to take our toys and boys and leave? Nearly all 50 committees of the Urja recommended the postponement of the of signing the agreement. The other recommendations from various committees ran the gamut from uh, allowing Afghan observers to attend American military trials, which, by the way, had to be held in Afghanistan, to banning Christian religious observances on American military bases. You think this is about Islam? Another recommendation was for an American military base in the remote province of Baim, which was the only peaceful place in the country. For her part, Mrs. Rice warned Karzai that his refusal to sign the agreement would jeopardize 
Western aid to Afghanistan, including an amount exceeding $4 billion a year just to support its military, which is entirely dependent upon American aid. The president insisted on the uh, the stance that a total ban on uh, home raids uh, uh, is absolutely essential. The Afghan people need to see that the United States has changed its behavior and that home raids are banned. So all a Taliban uh, jihadist has to do is walk into a home and uh, a, la, a la oxen free, you can't shoot me. Perfect, huh? Can continue to hide beneath the skirts of their women, behind the lives of their children. And there's nothing the United States can do. So why be there? Why not just leave? We have uh, Larry on the line. And Larry, I'd like your uh, comment on uh, something that uh, is not in the published news this morning, but was on the, uh, the um, network news this morning. You're familiar with uh, Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields Are Forever? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Beatle, Beatle songs, right? Beatle songs. Right. You know what the, uh, the uh, nickname is for uh, Gitmo, Guantanamo Bay? The prison. Uh, Penny Lane, isn't it? No, no, well, actually, Strawberry Fields is the uh, is the name of, yeah, of I, Gitmo. Yesterday, I saw it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. and Penny Lane is the uh, is the high rent uh, quarters, uh, eight bungalows uh, uh, in the Strawberry Fields. It's called Penny Lane. Now, Penny Lane was the luxurious um, uh, uh, housing arranged for the Muslims that were the worst offenders, that the CIA came up with this idea that they would turn against their religion, turn against their God, to accept money on behalf of the United States. So they took, in Penny Lane, they took the worst of the uh, jihadists that they had captured in Afghanistan and Iraq, and they uh, gave them millions of dollars. And then they gave them access to uh, unlimited amounts of porn, and they gave them really plush apartments. And they said, all right, uh, we'll continue to give you all this money, and all you have to do is we're going to release you. We're going to keep the lesser inmates, but we're going to release you with the proviso that you turn on your God and you turn on your home team. Now, you were willing to die for your God, but now for this money, this bribe, and this access to unlimited porn... You will turn on your God, and you're going to be a double agent on our behalf. How do you think that worked out, Larry? To uh, Shattery Miss, we did the last segment with me asking uh, Larry a question regarding uh, Penny Lane, where the uh, CIA chose to uh, bribe uh, fundamentalist Muslims in Gitmo uh, with uh, unfettered access to uh, porn and uh, and multi-million dollar bribes to uh, turn on their God and their religion and their people and become a double agent for the CIA as if they were still working during the uh, the Cold War, and the foe was uh, was the USSR. So how do you suppose it worked, uh, Larry? Probably worked out the way the CIA intended it to. I mean, I see this never-ending war on terror. You know, as, as, as you've discussed, you can't have a war on a tactic. Mm -hmm. uh, as just another way to uh, uh, subjugate the American people. Uh, you know, put up TSA yep. and roadblocks yep. and watch us yep. and, 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 and tax us and, and, and act like, uh, you know, those in power are doing, doing more, more good for us. We all know. Oh, yeah. That, uh. They're working against us. They're working against us. Sure. And, and I believe that they, they cultivate these terrorists. They go out and they read straight out of the Quran. And, yep. you know, they, they give them the lesson in religion, and they get that religion, and then, they, you know, they give them a couple of carrots, and then they'll go out and, you know, uh, perform for Allah. And, and yeah, well, I, I think it's all CIA run. I really do. Yeah. Uh, you you yeah. got your five leaders from Al-Qaeda, all-American born. I mean, what could be more obvious? You know, I mean, it's just getting to a point where Americans need to say enough. It's enough. 
Enough. Yeah. That's way, way beyond enough. Um, the program was discontinued in 2006 after they released uh, all of these uh, these uh, prisoners. Uh, and uh, well, thank they, you for the, uh, the the education on <laughs> yeah yeah there you go uh, the yeah the uh, the fact is that uh, they they ended the program because not a single one of them uh, used. Uh, um, was a benefit. Not a single one of them provided us, the United States with any uh, helpful intel. Not a single one of them acted as a uh, double agent. So we squandered the millions of dollars and uh, uh, and uh, uh, got nothing for it. And uh, and of those that we tracked initially, your your company and squandered millions of dollars on a worthless project. That was stupid. Well, it's actually counterproductive because uh, those that we actually maintained uh, track of, uh, they returned to being jihadists and uh, terrorists. Well, that's what so I it, said. I think, I, think, yeah. I think the CIA got the result of what they wanted. I, yeah. I think Which is a, a reason for them to be able to impose all sorts of restrictions uh, on Americans and being able to spy on Americans because terrorism continues. Not uh, to just don't look behind the curtain and to see who's funding it, who's arming it, who's fueling it. It's, it's like the situation yeah, I, in Afghanistan. We we well, the, armed the Taliban and now we're at war with the Taliban. We had to create an enemy to justify a war. Well, you know, if, if you're going to run heroin out of Afghanistan, I suppose that's what you need to do. You know, yeah. the, the, the truth of the matter is that we have a rogue government now that, that is openly attacking American people. And, so we have and, for a long time. Well, yeah, we but they, it, they weren't so out in the open about it. You know, I mean, the last five years has been really eye-opening. Well, I, I don't think it was any – in fact, I would say in some ways it was worse under uh, George W. Bush. This was a George W. Bush plan. had nothing to do with Obama. Uh, so, uh, oh, no, no, no. Obama no. said – to shut the plan down, so. Yeah, Obama is just, you know, I'm, I'm, this is not, I'm saying in the last five years it's been eye-opening. Yeah. I'm not saying it wasn't going on under Bush. I, I mean, some of us were just a little more deluded at that point. I was. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I think the difference is that uh, George Bush was, uh, was just pure evil but not very smart, and so George Bush tried to, uh, to fool people uh, quietly. Where uh, Obama is uh, has a messianic complex. He thinks he's smarter than everybody else in the world, and that he's the world he's savior. The savior. So, so, so that uh, he is the devil incarnate. He is the, he is he is proclaiming himself to be the savior of the world when he is uh, um, amongst the world's most evil men. And so, you just have a different voice in the White House, a different attitude, but the behavior is essentially the same. Speaking of stupid. You know that the yeah, yeah, yeah. you know that the United States has this thing called an air defense identification zone. If you're not a pilot, maybe you don't know about this. But the United States, uh, uh, on its coastal waters, going out anywhere from it's an average of about 500 miles. There's some places uh, around the Florida Keys where it's uh, uh, less than that, but for the most part, it's it's three to 500 miles around Alaska uh, near uh, Russia and China. It goes out over a thousand miles, but it's called the uh, air uh, uh, defense identification zone. And if an airplane has not uh, filed, a pilot has not filed a flight plan with uh, the FAA and has not uh, uh, reported in within minutes of entering the, the uh, air defense identification zone, identifying themselves as the airplane who previously filed the flight plan for uh, the right to fly through it, you'll be intercepted by American uh, fighters. That is what we have in place. The Chinese tried to do the same thing. We'll return to that story in a moment. Back to uh, Shattering Mist. Yes, the United States uh, is the most hypocritical nation on uh, Earth. Uh, its government and its international dealings. Its dealings with its own people in terms of the government routinely does what uh, it prohibits its own citizens from being able to do, and uh, it uh, also uh, uh, denounces drug money through banks would be one of them. Yeah, it would be a, it would be a good example of that uh, while uh, sacrificing the lives of soldiers in foreign wars. Now, the this particular instance is the United States decided that they were going to fly B-52 bombers through the new uh, Chinese uh, uh, air defense identification zone. Now, all the Chinese did is they said, 
uh, approximately 300 miles off its shores uh, in the Pacific Ocean, that it had a, uh, a air defense identification zone, and that all they requested is that any aircraft that wished to fly through the air defense uh, identification zone, which was about 300 miles off the, uh, the east coast of China in the Pacific Ocean, was that they file a flight plan and that they identify themselves when they enter. That's exactly what the United States requires of its air defense identification zone. The only difference is the United States air defense uh, identification zone is much larger than is China's. So the United States said, you know, we're not going to allow China to do that. So we, we flew B-52s through the uh, air defense identification zone without announcing our presence. Talk about B-52 bombers. Talk about being provocative. I mean, what are we trying to do, start a war with China? Is that what this government wants, is a war with China? I think this government does want a war. I think, I think so, too. Chaos comes control, and yeah, I think it's true. on the edge of being caught for a whole lot of crimes, the people at the top. Yeah. And they, they know one thing. If they can get people waving a flag and saying, yes, let's go get them, they all come together and get behind a leader. So, yes, yeah. I do think so. Yeah, and in this, in this particular case, we're protesting something that we ourselves do. Uh, let me read this to you. Oh, wow. The United States. Wow. Yeah. What's yeah. new about that, Yada? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Help me the out United here. States. The United States formally uh, defines an air defense identification zone in the Code of Federal Regulations, 14 CFR Part 99. Furthermore, 14 CFR Part 99.49 states, "Quote: All airspace of the United States is designated defense area." in which, by definition, the control of aircraft is required for reasons of national security. Therefore, the ADIZ forms a transition zone in which aircraft come under positive identification and control by air traffic and defense authorities. No person may operate an aircraft into, within, or from a departure point within an air defense identification zone, which goes 500 miles off the shore of the United States unless the person files, activates, and closes a flight plan with the appropriate aeronautical facility or is otherwise authorized by air traffic control. Now, the United States is much more assertive in its demands regarding this air defense identification zone. And yet, we're going to fly bombers through China's? I mean, we're utter and complete hypocrites being provocative with a country that has become the de facto leader in the world. Let me share a little story that, uh, that also came out uh, on, uh, on China this morning. This is from CNN. Many expected uh, Xi Jinping to focus on internal politics during his first year of office and not make major external moves. By the way, his first announcement was uh, internal uh, politics. What he did is said that the enterprise zones that were working so well in the cities, which enabled free uh, uh, enterprise to, uh, to occur, that turning back the clock to what America once was, I know America has become a combination of socialist and fascist and total control over uh, businesses so they're no longer productive. Well, in China, they did exactly the opposite. In, in enterprise zones around the country, they said free enterprise uh, can prevail. We will not intervene. We will allow private ownership and private control of businesses. They said that was so successful in China, became, China became the leading manufacturing country of the world, that they've now expanded it to the entire country. That was the first thing he did as president. That was a domestic act. But now he is busy designating and implementing a bolder foreign policy in light of an anticipated U.S. decline. Do you hear the last part of that? But everyone in the world, everyone in the world, outside of, uh, of those who are just humming along in the United States, maybe singing one of the tunes on the Penny Lane album, maybe singing Strawberry Fields are forever. Everyone knows that the United States is in rapid decline, that the future of this country as we know it is a matter of years. I can't tell you if we're going to absolutely collapse in chaos Within five years, ten years, or fifteen years, but within fifteen years, America will cease to be a nation of any consequence in the world. And the world knows it. China knows it. That's why China is 
busy designing and implementing a bolder foreign policy plan in light of the anticipated U.S. decline. The strategy was made clear this weekend. It's why, by the way, in the uh, tribulation, there's only <clears throat> one reference to the United States in the end times, and it's in uh, Yashaya, Isaiah 17 and 18. And you know that there are 12 adjectives that are used to describe the United States, and, uh, and that it says that the United States, uh, this country, um, uh, meddled with uh, Israel, looting it, thinning the nation at the waste, which means we forced Israel to give up Gaza and the West Bank. And as a result of that, the very people that we had tried to appease by forcing Israel to give up land that we didn't have any control over or rights to, uh, to control, that those very people, the Muslims, act as terrorists and they destroy our largest cities. That's, that's the only mention of the United States. They, well, it does say, boy, which means, whoa. <laughs> yeah, well, it does say, well, it does. Now, as it relates to China... The, there are two wars fought during the tribulation. The first of the wars is uh, is a war that is started by a declining United States. That's the Magog War. We lit the fuse of this war when we invaded uh, Iraq and gave Iraq to Iran. Well, we actually uh, lit the fuse when we gave Ayatollah Khomeini uh, reign over Iran. <laughs> That's what we did. But yeah, we, we, and we furthered it. Yeah. Yeah, we, 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 go, we can go back further than that in terms of the CIA's involvement and the, uh, and the establishment of, uh, of the Shah and government there, too, where, uh, where, we, where the CIA was involved in some very dastardly uh, deeds. So we, we not only established the Shah in, uh, under uh, uh, hideously disgusting uh, uh, tactics. When he decided we, he wouldn't give him all the oil, we got rid of him and, and, and said, okay, that's correct. And here comes yeah, okay. his that's, sure. There we go. That, so, uh, well, tw that, twice. Just, just let me mention something here real quick. And, and that goes right back to what's found in Yasha Yahu, where mm -hmm. it talks about, it says that uh, this Gentile nation who sets the rules, speaking in strange foreign languages, yes. Talking a lot, saying meaningless things while marching off to war, a powerful nation that treads down and subjugates, imposing its will on others while leaving their, quote, downfall. There we go. So, yeah. so we actually always do more harm than good. Yeah, when they now, that sounds like the United States uh, in, in today's world. Uh, and that isn't even any, that doesn't even include any one of the 12 adjectives defining the specific nation that, that is responsible for uh, this self-destructive behavior. Anyway, speaking of, uh, of China, uh, during the, uh, the, well, the winning days of the tribulation, there's a second war uh, fought. It's called Armageddon. Uh, it's Armageddon. Uh, the rendezvous uh, is uh, of, at the, uh, the mountain. And uh, in that particular war, you, uh, you have uh, a 200 million person army that is marching across the the uh, Tigris and Euphrates rivers uh, into Israel, which means they're coming in from uh, from the east uh, from China. Uh, and at that time, you know, keep in mind, Team Islam is gone. Yahweh himself annihilates the Muslims in the Magog War who attacked Israel. And so, what you see is that the only vast military power in those days are um, Muslims who Yahweh defeats and uh, and then China. And what you're witnessing in China is China stepping up to say, yeah, we're ready to play that role. <laughs> it's almost as if they read the uh, the play and said, yeah, we're supposed to uh, to turn, yeah, we're supposed to turn uh, in the last days, 20 years from now, into uh, Israel's primary enemy. So, uh, and we're going to come through the, uh, the oil and gas reserves that have unified us with the Muslims. Um, and here we go. And indeed okay. they are. It's all playing out. I mean, we're, one thing that we're doing, in, in, even though it's a pretty, feels like a fairly nervous situation to most people, uh, we're, we're watching prophecy unfold. Yeah, we are. It's like we're, uh, we're literally in, in each day's newspaper seeing the, uh, the fulfillment of what Yahweh promised between uh, two and 3,500 years ago. The, in China, the, the whole tone has changed. You know, unlike his predecessors, this article reads, uh, Xi is, uh, is 
making foreign policy with the mindset of being the greatest power, of increasingly probing U.S. commitments to its allies uh, throughout the world and exploiting opportunities to change what has been, but no longer is, the status quo. Traditional mantras like non-interference and hide our capacities and hide our t- and bide our time are no longer evident under uh, the new China. Those, the new slogan is the Chinese dream. It sounds very much like uh, the American uh, despicable uh, concept of manifest destiny. A vision for a national rejuvenation of the Chinese people. And in that started way back under Deng Xiaoping. I mean, he took a he took a, a, a country that was two thirds uh, communist, one third collective, turned it into two thirds collective and one third privatized. I mean, he yeah. made the industrial revolution look weak. That's I mean, correct. Think about it. Right. They, you know what they have is percentage now of GDP. On right. That. What they have done is they have have uh, have combined free enterprise economics. With, uh, with central communist uh, politics. And so they, they've recognized that communist economics are a universal failure. It's the, and if you look at the Pope's statements uh, here yesterday, he wrote a manifesto criticizing uh, capitalism and, uh, and uh, bemoaning and the, the need for the, the yeah, the, worldwide. right, yeah, yeah, that's right, the control socialism, yeah, communism right. worldwide. Most people have, have figured out, the Chinese most certainly did, that communism is a complete failure from an economic point of view. So he, he as a communist, said we're going to let communism be the religion and the political institution, but the economics is going to be free enterprise because that works, and China became the most powerful uh, nation on earth, the leading manufacturer uh, in the world, and the country that is rapidly replacing what was once the late great United States. We'll return to Shattering Mists, uh, and we're here with uh, Larry having called in from Florida after the commercial break. Stay with us. I'd like to return to the topic we were talking about uh, yesterday, which is the, uh, this uh, preamble of the, uh, of the four-page document uh, that the United States uh, has heralded as a uh, brand-new accord with uh, Iran, when in fact Iran didn't give up anything meaningful, maybe nothing at all, and uh, gained over $7 billion in foreign uh, currency. Uh, and immediate ability to sell uh, its oil on world markets. Uh, it's about as one-sided as uh, any deal could possibly be. It's, uh, it's amazing that Netanyahu has restrained himself uh, to uh, just calling it uh, a, uh, a tragic mistake. Now, yesterday, remember, we said that we read this part of the preamble. It says this comprehensive solution, which is the anticipated solution. It's not this agreement, because this agreement is simply a six-month interim uh, agreement. And it's all designed to to be the first step towards a comprehensive agreement, which has not been negotiated. And it says the comprehensive solution would constitute an integrated whole where nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. You've been in business, uh, you've been in politics, uh, Larry, you've even been uh, religious at one time of your life. Have you ever engaged in a negotiation with anyone where everyone agreed to everything? No. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. No. No. You know, I've uh, I built a lot of businesses. Uh, I was uh, an ordained ruling elder in the Presbyterian Church, the one, youngest, I think, in church uh, history. Even went to the uh, the national uh, uh convention and was the keynote speaker uh, at it. Uh, uh, worked on the most controversial topic at that time. Was very involved in, in uh, American politics. Guys like uh, John McClown from uh, Arizona. Know him personally. He's been in my home. Uh, I've been in uh, George W. Bush's uh, home. I know him personally. I know these guys. Uh, I, I was once there, oh. and you know, and one time, you know, uh, my uh, company that I founded uh, was worth uh, three and a half billion dollars. So, you know, I've negotiated some agreements in my day. I have never ever engaged in an agreement where everybody thought that everything was uh, was as it should be. You know, and I I'm a guy that really works to find common ground, I and mean, I don't want to enter an agreement that is one sided. I, I never negotiate to win. 
I always negotiate this so that we have a mutually beneficial agreement, and yet it's impossible in any agreement. But, yeah, there right. has to be. A there, you, you never set up as a standard a comprehensive solution uh, uh, where nothing is agreed until everything is agreed, because everything is never agreed. And so what they're saying here is that we, we really have no intent of having an agreement and we want an escape clause. This comprehensive solution would involve a reciprocal step-by-step -step process and would produce the comprehensive lifting of all UN Security Council sanctions as well as multilateral and national sanctions related to Iran's nuclear program. Uh, have you ever seen anything in the world politics where where the vote was uh, 100%, where every nation, there's 250 some odd nations on earth, that all 250 nations agreed to do exactly the same thing? I don't believe so, no. And so they're saying for, for Iran to agree to do anything re regarding its nuclear program, it has to have the United Nations sanctions and all sanctions by every country anywhere in the world removed. Do you think there's... Any chance whatsoever that's going to occur? No, no, of course no, of course not. not. Now they call this it looks the like Iran's uh, Ayatollahs are, are buying Ayatollahs are buying into it either. No, they, uh, they, they call this this the elements of a first step. The first step would be time bound with a duration of six months. So this first step it only applies to Iran for six months. After six months, none of the restrictions apply. But in that six months, Iran. Even the U.S. senators are saying we'll gain a minimum of seven billion dollars, and it's renewable by mutual consent during which all parties will work to maintain a constructive atmosphere for negotiations in good faith. Now, by the way, those those terms are Western terms; they are not Islamic terms. Iran would undertake the following measures: first measure, from existing uranium enriched to twenty percent, retain half as working stock of 20% oxide for fabrication of fuel for the TRR, that's a research reactor. Dilute the remaining 20%, UF6, to no more than 5%. No reconversion line. All right. That's the only thing that America can hold their hat on and said, this is what we got out of this agreement. Iran now has uh, just shy of 300 uh, kilograms of uranium rich to 20%. The moment they, they did that, they were announcing to the world, we're building a bomb. Now, all that America asked for is to take half of it to oxide. We'll talk about what that means actually on Shattering Myths tomorrow's, during tomorrow's program because we're going to turn uh, to the covenant when Shattering Myths continues after the news.